Hello and welcome to the Divine Renovation Podcast, where we seek to inspire and equip you to bring your parish for maintenance to mission. My name's Dan, and we're mixing things up a little bit. Uh, we, we, after some feedback, we decided what we're going to do is we're going to have a bit of a conversation uh, one week on our podcast and tie it into the guests that we're going to be bringing on in the following week. So today around the table, I've got with me Ron Huntley, Director of Coaching at Divine Renovation. Hey, Ron. Hey, bud. I've got Rob McDowell, who is one of our all-star coaches at DR. How are you doing today, Rob? It's great to be here, Dan. Awesome. And I've got Father James Mallon alongside me. Good to see you, Father. It's good to be seen. In our next week's podcast, we're going to be bringing on uh, Melanie, and she's fr- the president and founder of Faith Perceptions. What's cool about her is her, her organization, her company, they do uh, sort of like the secret shopper approach to to parishes. And so we'll, we'll hold off on what that looks like, and we'll get her to tell her story next week. But it got me thinking. It got me thinking about how do we understand what's it like to walk through, I guess, a, mm. a parish for the first time? Like what what are some of the experiences and how do we at Divine Renovation, how do we try and help parishes make that experience great? It's tricky. I remember years ago I was living in Truro and I ran into a friend of mine named Jeff and he's from an, a, a, a different tradition and uh, really, Chris, really strong Christian. And I asked him, you know, because he'd been living in, in this town for a while. I said, what church are you going to? He said, well, I haven't really connected myself to any one church yet. And I said, why? He said, because I, I told myself that I'm not going to join a church unless somebody shakes my hand and says, welcome. Oh, and he wow. said, and I've been going to church every week for months, and it hasn't happened yet. And to be honest with you, I thought to myself, gosh, if you came to my church, that wouldn't happen either. And it really <laughs> convicted me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's, it's so true. I can remember, Father James, do you mind me telling the story of the time I met you? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, the, the short version of the story, of course, was um, I, I, I found myself oh, at yeah. St. Benedict Parish, <laughs> and, uh, and and because I had to walk there, um, it was a long haul for me. St. Benedict Saint Parish? Oh, sorry, not St. Benedict Parish. Of course not. Uh, <laughs> at St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and so St. Thomas... Say, I met you before that. <laughs> it was long. We met long, years and years and years before St. B's. Um, but yeah, so I remember going to, to St. Thomas Aquinas, and I remember sitting uh, there, and I would arrive early, and you used to have this habit, and perhaps you still do, uh, of walking around uh, the, the church before Mass starts and, you, and you'd say hello to people you didn't recognize. And I can remember you coming over and, and saying, hi, I'm Father James. What's your name? And I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm Dan. It's, it's nice to meet you. And I got to be honest, the first time that happened, I was floored. I was blown away that that, that you cared. I mean, like it, it sounds trite, but I mean it sincerely. Like it, it made a big difference and an impact on me. And so next week when you did it again, you walked over to me and you said, hi, I'm Father James Brown. Who are you? <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder if he remembers that. Or not. I've had some embarrassing moments. With you know, I've always been driven with a conviction that you know on a weekend the the my radar is up for new faces yeah and and it can be a difficult thing because you have some very wonderful beautiful familiar faces who want to surround you and yes. and take you know and, and take charge of your time either before mass or afterwards and i'm always scared i never want to be inattentive to anyone who's speaking with me. You know, we've all had the experience you're talking to someone and they keep looking over our shoulder and you're like, that person doesn't want to talk to me. Mm. So it kind of, it's tough because I want to give all my attention. And yet I know that there's, there are people that are visitors and I, I want to welcome them. Yes. And it's like, come on people, let's, let's, let's get in on this together. So one of the things I always did was go around and, in nine times out of 10, I get, I get it right. I've, I've been fairly good at, at recognizing that's an unfamiliar face. <laughs> And once in a while, I get it wrong. A couple of years ago at St. Benedict Parish, there was this couple I went up to and I said, hi, I'm Father James. Uh, which, welcome to the parish. Are you, are you visiting? Are you new? And it was like, uh, no, Father, we've been coming here every week for the last seven years. And this is the third time you've asked us that question. Like, oh, oh, that's really bad. Yes. And the last week we'll be attending. Yeah. <laughs> so so next week we're going to join a new parish. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want these horror stories to dissuade people because I was on the receiving end. I was the person who you came up and you introduced yourself to three weeks in a row and, and asked me who I was. But it made a difference to me. So like, even if you get it wrong, even when you make the mistake, you know, it, 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 conv- it conveys something, right? It conveys a sense of hospitality, a sense of welcome, and that matters. Yeah. Well, I remember like some Sometimes I'd be out front at St. Benedict Parish welcoming people outside and opening can we, the Can door. we talk about it, though? Because like the, sure. I want to paint the picture. Okay. So what it's like for Ron Huntley to, to work the door at St. Benedict Parish, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I used to love it when the two of us were there. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's so much fun. <laughs> oh, so so if, if I mean, that St. Benedict Parish, giant, big, wooden, oak front doors, right? Like these massive wooden doors. Just like the book. <laughs> Divine Renovation <laughs> Yeah, book. like the cover of, of the Divine Renovation book. And, and you know, Ron, my experience uh, of you out there is you, you've got the biggest smile I've ever seen you wear. And you're just, you're standing at the 
the front door, just smiling at every single person that's coming in and saying, hey, welcome, good morning, welcome, good morning. And so that, that's the feel of when you arrive. always with that energy, but <laughs> that's how it feels for <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen many times when it hasn't been that much energy, just, just, just for what it's worth. And that was a cool thing, you know, we would, it wasn't every week we'd be out front, but, and then other people began, began to jo- join us and to do it as well. But inside the doors in the foyer, we had people who were, who were g- greeting. And then the, the, the doors leading into, into the sanctuary or into the nave of the church had greeters on those doors. And we had the welcome booth at the time. Now we have a welcome center as well. And when you get inside the doors, there's people inside the doors who are going to help you as well. So you're literally moving through about four layers of welcome when, when, and on a good weekend and a good, at a good mass mm. that we have everyone there to, to serve in their ministries. Well, the story I was going to tell is because Father James often joins me when he gets there outside too. And so together we would do it, which is so fun. And he always inspires me because he can see new people and he engages them and and so I'm feeling convicted that I've got to do a better job of engaging new people. And so I think I tried it two times in a row, and both times I was dead wrong, and I never did it again. <laughs> hey, you're new. No, no. I, I sat at your alpha table. Oh, <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> so I don't have that gift. So, okay, so Ron and Father that. James, both of you, yeah. why stand at that front door? Why? What? What? Because you're literally standing outside, and in, in, in Canada it can actually be a cold experience to be standing outside. Why are you doing it? Well, for me, it's like, I just, I do want to welcome people and and it's so important to me and I want to go above and beyond. Like for me, that's, and the other reason is I wasn't on the hospitality team Mm. and that was one of the doors that actually wasn't manned by the hospitality team. So if I went out there, I wasn't replacing anybody's job. (laughs) So it was because to be honest with you, it's my favorite thing to do in the whole church is to be there to welcome people. It's, I, I, it's my favorite role in yeah. the entire church. And I would say the same thing. I, I just, I love it. I love that, 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 that weekend experience and in, in being able to greet people. But as pastor, you know, having really changed my model of priesthood over the years to lean into leadership, to, to lean into, you know, preaching and leading and, and, and stepping away from the model of priesthood where basically I'm an on-call chaplain for anyone who wants to call father. Uh, when you step away from that, which if you're going to lead intentionally a, 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 a large church, or even a medium-sized church, or really any church, you're going to have to let go of that model, which means you've got to maximize. You've got to take, uh, you've got to grab onto the opportunities when you are visible and available to people, and that's Mm. around the weekend. So that's a valuable, for me, I was really convicted that I've got to maximize shaking hands, you know, connecting with people, saying, how are you, and welcome, and, and, you know, and making those kinds of connections. That allowed me, in a sense, to kind of, to, to lean into that other model during the rest of the week. Mm. Yeah, what was so fun about, you know, I remember when we, you know, after the first four years, we had a big transition in terms of structure, and that's when Rob and I came on uh, full-time, although Rob yeah. started part-time, but with the intent to come on full-time as we could we could afford to do that, and so we did. But it was so fun having Rob come on our team and help us to begin to see all the other things that we could do to bring down any barriers for those that weren't like us. Well, Father James, why don't you speak into that? Why why was Rob able to bring that kind of perspective in? <laughs> well, here's the thing. being Showing hospitality and welcoming people to our church is not just about what you do on Sunday morning. It's mm-hmm. how do you bring people into the life of the church? Uh, and and how, do you, how do you get people from the front door into, if they're not yet evangelized through, in, through an experience of evangelization like Alpha, how do you get them into a discipleship process? How do you get them in small groups, into ministry? All of those things. How do you open wide the doors of your church in every way? And sometimes it's not just in... Uh, it's lack of hospitality that can be an obstacle. There are things that are obstacles that we don't even see, just our, our vocabulary, the, the mm-hmm. way we talk, the way we do things that are all built on the presumption that everyone understands this and everyone understands what we mean by these terms. And sometimes it, it's you need someone from the, out, from the outside, just like Melanie's ministry, to come in and see the things that you don't see. Now, here's the, 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 the full story about Rob. We, I knew Rob for uh, a year and a half or so before he came to work at St. Benedict Parish. But when we opened up the position, uh, we had a conversation with Rob. And, and Rob, you're actually from a Wesleyan background, and you were an ordained Wesleyan pastor, and you still are Wesleyan. You are, you are, <laughs> still you're, ordained. Still ordained. Moment of truth. Moment of truth. You, Rob is not, we like to jokingly say, not yet Catholic, uh, but, but he's very much a part of our family. You continue to do um, weekend preaching 
and, and other, other churches. But one of the things when you came on, your, your unofficial job description was to help us to align all of our systems towards mission, because in your church, in your, in your church culture, your, your background, that's simply the way you guys think and see things. And I, I said to, to Rob, I want you to help us see the things that we don't see. Mm. Yeah. I was raised, actually, I grew up in a fairly small church, but even the small church, there tended to be a fair amount of awareness of the visitor. And so I don't really remember a time when I didn't have uh, at least that as an intention, whether I always did it well or not. But probably the when I was in college, I read a book, and it was written by a guy by the name of Lee Strobel, and it was called Inside the Mind of Unchurched Harry and Mary. And uh, in that, um, Lee, if uh, anyone has seen the movie The Case for Christ, same, yeah. same guy. And so uh, Lee was an atheist that encountered Christ at a church that created a Sunday morning experience to engage with an unchurched person. And so uh, Lee came to faith and eventually went on staff of that church and then wrote about it. And so that was very formative early on for me, even during college years, that this was something that uh, that that really mattered to people. And so it, all throughout my ministry, I've tried to uh, always have that as a part of it. And even one of the things that I did when I was uh, lead pastor at church one time is I would uh, take on church people out that had heard me preach. And uh, I would I'd buy them lunch and say, would you just tell me about your experience, A, at the church, and then B, about my preaching? And I wouldn't ask them if I if they agreed with it, but I would ask if they understood it. That's a great... You know, I wasn't, you know, like, if, if you didn't agree with what I said, that's fine. But but I, I wanted to make sure I was clear in what I was saying. And so when you come in, what what's it look like? Because I don't think we understand for the unchurched person the emotional stress mm. it is to visit a church for the first time. Yeah. Well, how many people do we hear say, oh, I, I can't go to that church if I walk through the doors, it would cave in on me. Or, you know, mm. they're they'll so, be struck by I'll, lightning. They'll be yeah. struck by lightning. Yeah. yeah, they're so aware that they should, or they feel like they shouldn't even be there. Yeah. Well, I'd agree with you. I was thinking the story of Jen, um, and maybe some of our listeners yes. are familiar with her story. Now, Jen, um, a couple of years ago, was hadn't ever been connected with church, and she, going through a difficult period in her life, was walking by, and she decided to come in on a weekend, but she stayed in the foyer because she felt absolutely terrified. Like, th- we're going to find out who she is, and we're going to throw her out, and she's not going to be welcome, and, and she she was actually really, really scared and felt that she was going to be judged. She was going to be condemned. She would not be welcomed. But as the weeks went on, as God began to work in her heart, and as she experienced hospitality from not just those in the hospitality ministry, right. but from the people in the pews, people who recognized that she wasn't, you know, uh, uh, someone who came all, all, all the time, they began to reach out to her. And slowly she came through the doors and was at the back of the church and then sat at the back. And then eventually she took Alpha and had a big a big conversion. Now she's leading ministries and she's the <laughs> MC on our latest out alpha. But what struck me the first time I heard her testimony was like, Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so out of touch with what it feels like to walk into our church. If you're, mm-hmm. if you haven't been going to church and I, I'm more and more aware now of, of the number of people who actually, they still will might have their conversion on, on alpha, but God has already begun to work in their hearts. Of course, uh, but but how many of actually actually do come through our doors in a weekend? And here's the thing about the divine renovation model: our primary, our our our, our how we engage the unchurched primarily is is Alpha. That's our invitation point. But we know that for for many people, that coming through the doors in a weekend is going to be their first point of contact with us. And that's why it's so important to absolutely maximize as much as possible the experience of the weekend and in in and around the liturgy as well. Well, I remember one of the things that was very formative for me, because I remember, you know, because I grew up in church, there was, I can count on one hand how many times I've been to church on, on a Sunday. And um, I remember someone one time challenging uh, me and saying, if you grew up in church, go to uh, a different religious experience that you're not familiar with. You know? And so a number of years ago, I went to a Jewish synagogue on a couple of different oh, occasions. Yes. And uh, it was it was interesting because I remember it's like, Think okay, I'm going to go to the synagogue. And then after I made the decisions, I don't even know if I'm allowed to go to a synagogue, right? In mm. fact, it was funny. I called them up and asked if I had permission to come, and uh, the person on the other end that, that answered the phone said, "You know, it's funny. We've had a few other people visit us and ask us that same question. You know, and it's it's not that they had a reputation, but it's like, I'm not Jewish. Do they want me there, right? And it was it was interesting. So I remember one time reading that 
Uh, first time visitors always underestimate the amount of time it takes to get from their home into the pew because the drive's probably a little bit longer and parking's probably a little bit harder. And so there's a good chance they're going to be late. And wouldn't you know, I got lost trying to find the synagogue and I was late. <laughs> and so I come in after they've started uh, their, their service. And uh, it was interesting because, of course, Jewish people wear yarmulkes. And I walked in and there was a basket full of yarmulkes there. And I didn't want to be offensive, but I didn't know whether I should wear one or not. Because, well, hmm. does everybody wear them or are they only for Jewish people? So I don't know if I should wear one or not because I'm not <laughs> Jewish, right? And so I ended up not, come to find out, it's not offensive if you're not Jewish to wear one. But That's I didn't stressful know stressful nonetheless. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm going in and I'm like, oh, what's, what's uh, you know, what's, what, what's going on? And so then you go in and, and, of course, this was a Jewish synagogue that still did most everything in Hebrew. So nothing made sense, you know, Um from it. So, but it was a, it was an interesting experience. Like it was, uh, it was like, like very, I was very anxious. I was very stressed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I was going to be accepted. And it's when you think that's what it's like for the average, like the average yeah. church person, they go, I don't go to that church. Why would I be accepted there? Because I'm not one of them. Mm. Right. And then, and then what is it that we can do to lower those barriers and help people. Uh, and as good of a job that we do, and I think at St. Benedict we do do a good job, and I think there's always room for improvement. Oh, I, always, I'm always yeah. mindful of the little things that we say that assumes everybody there is a Roman Catholic fully in communion with the church. And I know for a fact that's not true. Like how many spouses the truth bring is, their, When you yeah. become a missionary parish, more and more as your culture yeah. shifts, you're going to attract all kinds of people. Your 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 church, your church, your regular church goers. You're going to have more and more people who don't fit these yes. these little boxes that we that, that we presume. And and so it we it does tackle our, our our presumptions. It doesn't mean we change who we are and the essence of what we do. But we've we've just got to be more sensitive. And I think that often goes to preaching as well. I remember a couple of years I ago agree. having conversations with Father Simon, and he tells this story in his book, uh, Divine, Re- Divine Renovation Apprentice, great book, if, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, but how in his homilies he would, uh, in a sense, name drop well-known Catholics, obviously pr- with the presumption that everyone knows who such and such a person is, you know, throwing out a name like, you know, Christopher West or wh- whatever it is. And, and I would say, Simon, you know, basically anyone who because you're communicating a presumption, an expectation almost that you know who this person is, the person who doesn't know who that person is is going to feel like, oh, I'm not, I, maybe I'm not good enough or I don't know enough to be here. And right. it's just a simple thing to just add another, it's not that you don't have to mention this person's name, but just said, you know, you know, a Catholic writer who writes on this, on this topic, right. it changes everything. Hmm. And for him, it was a real revelation of, oh my goodness, yeah, I've, I've, I've kind of been doing that in, in, I didn't even know I was doing it. And that's, that's so why true. we need people like, like Rob, we'd have conversations and you'd always, you know, you were always incredibly respectful of our tradition. And, you know, we had obviously before you came on staff, we had a long conversation about, you know, you know, theologically and all this. And, and because we don't, we don't, we're not into compromise. You know, we, are, we are Catholic. You are who, who you, you come from your background and we value that and we treasure that. Uh, but you were always very respectful. I remember you would say, well, I have this, this thought or this observation. I'm not sure if it, if it would fit in a Catholic context. And I'd always say to you, leave that to me. Right. <laughs> You're here yeah. because I want to hear what you think. Yes. You know, and if it's, if it's something that, that crosses a line, I, I, I'll be the judge of that. Leave that for me. But I want you to be provocative. I want you to push us. I want you to question what we take for granted. I want you to help us to see what we don't see, because that's the thing about culture, is you become blind to it. You don't see, you don't know that you don't see it. Rob's actually wrecked it for me in a lot of ways because <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sensitive to all the things that he's helped me be aware of. That when I hear it, I cringe. Like sometimes you'll hear, "Oh, and and you all know the scripture passage on blah blah blah." I'm thinking, you can't say that. Don't say that. Or, "Oh, we're all good Catholics, therefore don't say or, that." Or even <laughs> preaching on the pro, on the premise that that everyone. I, I was in a, another country last year, and the gospel reading was on the beheading of John the Baptist and, and uh, you know, John the Baptist uh, preaching against Herod and, 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 and Herodias. And the preacher decided to preach on the sanctity of marriage and the total presumption that everyone in the church, totally 100%, was passionately in agreement with the teachings of the church. Right. And I'm thinking, 
Well, maybe they were. Maybe this was this extraordinary little bubble within this universe. But my experience of, of, of Catholic churches is that's not a good presumption to begin with. So even that presumption is kind of connected to hospitality as well. Even things like the announcements at the beginning of Mass with some of our intern priests who would come and when they preside, you know, we have these announcements that we, we make right at the beginning around prayer partners. And... And because they were learning this and they had been doing it now for a couple of months, they, some, it was quite common for them to get in the habit of saying to, the, to everyone in, in church, saying, as you know, right. as you all know, <laughs> we do this. And I'm like, no, don't presume that everyone knows. Always presume, always, always, always presume yes. and expect. Don't just presume, expect that you've got new people. Because even when you communicate that expectation on a Sunday morning, it reminds the regulars, oh yeah, yeah, we ought to expect that. Yeah. And and also that this is actually, I can I can invite people to mass. Mm. I mean, we're not, in our model, it's not, might not be the best first step, but but we're looking to maximize that 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 hospitality. Well, I think when people like when you get hymns, homilies, and hospitality right, like if you do a really good job of that, people are going to start inviting people to your mass yep. because they know that there's a level of of competence and excellence that they can count on week after week, and they're proud of it and they're excited about it, and it really does increase people's upper chance of of connecting in a way that. It's when it's terrible. We all feel embarrassed for the preacher or the music mm. that's really bad. We feel embarrassed. You know, the song's on, nobody's singing. You know, who wants to invite people to that? But if you get those three things right, people really will start inviting people from all kinds of different backgrounds and even non-Christians. Well, my, one of the things that's been difficult for me is I've just become accustomed to going to Mass at St. Benedict Parish. Now, but because of my role, because of what we do at Divine Renovation, we get to travel around. I get to go to lots of other churches, both Catholic and, and, and from, from other traditions. And and what, it can be quite jarring going to some other churches now because when you go in, they're not. I, I'm ex, my expectations have shifted in terms of what it's like to walk through through a, a Catholic church's doors, and 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 some people their, their parish aren't expecting guests, and I will be ignored, and I'm not getting the gauntlet of hospitality with Ron Huntley at the front door and the next you know row of volunteers, and then then the next and the next. I'm not feeling welcomed, and for me now it's very jarring because it feels like wow, this is this isn't what I'm used to. Do any of you have that kind of experience when you travel? Is there are you encountering Churches like that. <laughs> oh boy, I had a, I've had a couple of doozies of experiences this past this past summer. I was traveling with a priest friend of mine, Father Paul Morris, and we were in in uh, in Sicily, in Palermo. And on the weekend, we went to mass, and we were we were undercover shoppers. You know, we're on we're on, va- on vacation, so we went. There was a little church. Well, not a little church. It was a big church, and it was like a good church from like the 17th century. And we went into it on Sunday morning, and we were two of a total of 17 people at Mass. Mm-hmm. And we were the youngest people there. And not one single person looked at us, acknowledged our existence. There was, it was the antithesis of welcoming, either before, during, and after Mass. Even the priest, who was a younger guy, you, we might as well not have been there. And I remember being so disturbed by the experience that I was actually angry. And I've, I've had, unfortunately, too many experiences like that. But what struck me was that night we went out for supper and we came back and the church is right on the piazza. And that night in the piazza, there must have been two, three hundred young people, literally at the, at the doorstep of the church. There was an outdoor band. There was music for people celebrating, full of life. And here's this church building all basically boarded up and locked up that's right there, right there on the edge of this, of this, uh, of this piazza where, which if you think about it, this is meant to be a missionary outpost and it's closed up and it's, and it's boarded up and it's, and what's communicated on a weekend is we're, we're a happy little group of, of, uh, of, that belong to this church club. And, uh, and we, we, they communicate very strongly. We don't want anyone uh, at all. So that's a tragic thing. That's really, really tragic. And I think that goes to the, the deep uh, crisis of our church, which you know spoke about in the original book, that we we truly have an identity crisis. We've forgotten who we are. When we when we actually live like that, when we do church like that, we're we're confused. We're really confused. Well, I always go back to uh, Saint Paul's words in Colossians four, and at the first part of that chapter, he says, uh, "Be wise in the way that jack towards outsiders. Mm. You know, making the most of every opportunity." And he's not necessarily speaking to how you do church on a weekend, but I don't think. 
you can certainly apply the passage mm-hmm. to how you, you do church, right? I think he's probably more talking about our daily interactions with people, but he's saying be intentional about when you're coming in contact with someone that doesn't know the person of Jesus mm-hmm. and recognize your interaction matters, mm-hmm. whether that's one-on-one or whether that's in a public setting. Rob, let, let me ask you a question in, in terms of you coming from, from a, from a non Catholic background, you know, you understand what the Eucharist is, but what, what, what would you say t- to the average Catholic listener about some things that they might want to be attentive to in terms of being being more accessible or being more welcoming without compromising. Would you say like in, in personal contact or in the context of a mass? Mm-hmm. In, the, in the mass, like when someone comes in on a weekend, yeah. like from beginnings, what, 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 what are the major things that in your experience that you've, that you've observed? I'll say what, 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 what uh, uh, catch my attention probably the most when I first started coming to Mass, and the majority of the time was daily Mass because when I first started coming on, on staff and coming out of, you know, our background, we care about uh, contextualizing the message, being relevant, being, you know, and so, and I had very little, um, you know, very little of what we'd follow the church calendar. You know, I remember you asked me, do you guys follow the church calendar at all? And I think I said, yeah, we've never skipped an Easter or Christmas yet, right? <laughs> 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 so, so you know, and, and especially I did a number of years doing youth ministry. In youth ministry, you're always trying to figure out what's happening in the culture and culture is always changing and, you know, like staying relevant on the culture and it just kind of gets drilled into your head. Mm. And all of a sudden you're stepping into this experience that they've been, you know, in the Catholic church, when they say we've been doing that for a thousand years, they don't mean that as a joke. They mean that, <laughs> they, they, they mean that literally, right? Like I come out of, I come out of a history where we say that and it's a joke because <laughs> we've not been doing anything for a thousand years. I remember one of the things sitting there and you know, and again, you had the idea like, okay, you're just going to go into this rote service. They're just repeating stuff. They're just, da, 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 you know, all that sort of stuff. And I remember sitting there and seeing people really engage with what was happening. And they were really encountering Christ in a powerful way. And I remember that standing out to me. And I, I think I remember one of the things that a lot of times people want, you know, is it relevant and does it connect to them? To, you know, and there's, there's all of that. But I think at the heart of it are people encountering Christ. Amen. Right? right. And I think that's that's the key and is it just is your environment just passive people kind of coming in doing their because even it doesn't matter whether it's ritualistic or not and even if, if it's not we engaged. eventually invent our own <laughs> ritual anyway yeah. because it's just the way we're hardwired yeah. as human beings and so i remember that being like that that standing out to me it's like huh okay so and and it car you know and i i still value contextualization but it it that that really stood out to me saying so, hmm, yeah that that matters so Anything that's life transformative for people is always going to be relevant, regardless mm. of the, you know, like what I talk about the container and the content of the container, yep. right? And so while while the container isn't irrelevant, you always want to make sure what's the content in the container, right? And I think we can we can sometimes get so caught up in are we being cool and are we, right, that we, we forget the content in it. And so, I think that's a key difference for us, you know, we, we come from a, a, a liturgical tradition and that's essentially why in our, in our model, we say that we're, we're not going to, to make it the, the weekend mass and the experience of the weekend to be that engaging in that level or that relevant, you, you would break the integrity of it because it's not what the mass is, is actually for. It's not meant to be an evangelistic tool. It, it's not meant to be a, something to, to catch fish. Uh, it's, it, it's meant to feed sheep and, and we're, it presumes a level of belief. It presumes a level of belonging. And, and yet to be a missionary church, your broad approach doesn't start with believing or behaving. It really starts with giving people an experience of belonging. That, and the liturgy sometimes can be quite limited in that. Mm-hmm. So, so you can, you, we can take different approaches to maximize it. But it's a cer- at a certain point, the fact is that I'm still wearing a green dress. <laughs> <laughs> and we're up there saying Kyrie eleison and people are like isn't that like a rock song from the 1980s and what the heck like what does this mean and then we're doing the baseball signals <laughs> and the crosses and it can be really confusing to people so we've got to we've got to acknowledge that got to, yeah. yeah and i think yeah i think the acknowledgement is the key like a in the mass but even what we preach on never not everything we preach on is targeted for someone that's not a person of faith but we still try to communicate it in a way that they would understand. So we'll still preach on yeah. giving money, right? But we will just acknowledge, hey, if this is new to you, this is going to sound weird. And this is probably why someone warned you not to come here because you think this is the cult and all that sort of, you know, like. But but just even acknowledging, you know, if you're reading a passage of scripture where there's a miracle or, you know, something like that. So this is probably a, a new thought for you. 
right? And, you know, you just, you don't necessarily have to camp there, but by acknowledging it, right. you're just communicating that you recognize that the people are there that don't necessarily uh, automatically agree with that or understand it or even believe in it. Rob, what I love is that you and the other coaches are, are helping to, to coach into, into <clears throat> pastors, parish priests around the world on some of these very key principles, helping them to go through this, this transformation, because it is a mind shift, I think, for so many leaders. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cut here because next week we got a, a guest coming on and we're going to be able to go deeper into the conversation with Melanie, understand how she and her, her organization, uh, Faith Perceptions, how they try and offer that same outside perspective that you were able to offer, Rob, to the team at St. Benedict Parish when you came on team there. So thanks so much, guys, for, for being with us today. Uh, for those of you who are watching and have been along for the conversation, if you haven't downloaded the Divine Renovation app, now is your moment. Seize your moment. Download the Divine Renovation app. We're, we're updating it weekly with, with articles and, uh, and, of course, this podcast and other things. So it's a great way to stay connected with this ministry and with us. And thanks so much for joining us, and God bless.